We are very glad and honored to have here with us as our guest, Professor Donald Brew. He is a British biologist and emeritus professor of animal welfare at Cambridge University. He has operated as a scientific advisor for the Standing Committee of the Council of Europe for the Welfare of Animals Cap for Farming Purposes, chairman of the European Union Scientific Veterinary Committee for the Animal Welfare Section, and member of the Farm Animal Welfare Council of the United Kingdom. He uh, continues to hold uh, important positions such, a, such as uh, Vice President of the European Food Safety Committee on Animal Health and Welfare and Chair of the Working Group on Animal Welfare during Land Transport for the World Organization for Animal Health. Uh, professor, thank you for being with us. Uh, I, have, uh, I have attended uh, your speech uh, at the conference titled uh, The Next Political Terms, What's on the Horizon for Animals, uh, which took place uh, at the European Parliament last year. And I was uh, very impressed, uh, not only by your uh, outstanding competence, but also by the clarity of your vision of the matters. You are a scientist uh, as well as a, a science communicator. You have written many books and papers uh, on ethology, animal welfare uh, and evolution, and I'm very fascinated by your, by how you have managed to link these issues uh, with not only scientific, but also cultural and uh, philosophical themes. My first question is a, a big question. How intelligent are animals, especially pets, uh, and to what extent we can say they have feelings? Well, well firstly, we are animals. Humans are animals. And we share a very large amount of our brain function and our general body function with other species. So we are not very different from other species. And so if you look at how our brain is functioning and how the brain of a, a dog or a pig or a cow is functioning or uh, a bird, then there are, there are very few differences and a lot of similarities. And if you, if you analyze the behavior, then you can see that the animals are planning the world in which they live. They are predicting what is going to happen to them before it happens. Re they are not just reacting to what happens. Uh, and so their, their life is complex and they have to organize their lives in a sophisticated way using their uh, brains. And in the use of the brain, one of the important functions is the emotional responses, feelings, feelings like uh, pain and fear and various forms of pleasure. And we now have lots of information for a wide range of animals, which show that they have the same kind of range of feelings that we have. I mean, that comes from looking at behavior and physiology of the animals. So the, 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 the similarities are much greater than the differences. Humans are just one kind of animal, and we are not so different from our dog not so different from our parrot, for example. We, ha we now have so much uh, interesting information about the cognitive functioning of dogs, about how they are responding to humans in detail, about the extent to which they're showing emotional behavior, uh, which kinds of emotional behavior they're showing, uh, how they respond to emotional changes in humans, we know a lot more now about the communication between people and dogs, and, and it's clear that dogs are extremely well adapted to respond to other members of their social group, and that, of course, they are regarding humans as members of their social group in many cases. So I think this is a fascinating area where there has been a lot of research in the last 10 years, and there is really a lot to say on this subject. Very clear. Professor, you have developed a very interesting concepts and the methods of scientific assessment of animal welfare in relation to housing, transport, and the sustainable livestock production system. In particular, in addition to farm animals, you have recently focused your attention also on pets. In Italy, uh, we have a law that uh, punishes the detention of animals in ways that are not uh, compatible with their ethological characteristics uh, and therefore detrimental to their well-being. However, 
in many cases, uh, public veterinarians uh, do not give much importance to the symptoms uh, of the so-called etological cruelty. Uh, unless there are visible signs of injury or physical impairment, many signs of discomfort, such as stereotypes or rather behaviors of animals that are kept uh, in, in unfit uh, environments, are, are not taken into the appropriate consideration during uh, the routine inspection of public veterinarians uh, in the pounds, in the shelter, uh, as well as in farms. The questions I would like to, to ask you in, in this regard are the following. In, in the United Kingdom, uh, is there a, a, any specific training on animal welfare assessment methods for public veterinarians who have to carry out uh, checks on the farms uh, or, or pound shelters? And uh, uh, the other question is, uh, do you think that this kind of training for veterinarians should be harmonized in Europe and required by law? Well, it, it, of course, it is, it is regulated by law in that everywhere in the European Union, uh, in order to qualify as a veterinarian, you have to have some training in uh, animal welfare science. It's a part of the curriculum in Italy, in the United Kingdom, everywhere in Europe. So there is, there is some knowledge for, that all veterinarians have now. Uh, for 30 years ago, they didn't have it. Now everybody has it. It's, it is, it, there is a, a directive about veterinary education. It includes this. So everybody learns something about it. But what you're asking me is, if you are the veterinarian who is going in and inspecting in a, a place where there are dogs or where there are other animals kept, then do they, are they trained in dealing with exactly that situation? And the answer is exactly. sometimes, sometimes they are and sometimes they are not. So there are people who are very familiar with all of the scientific literature about the assessment of animal welfare in a scientific way. They know what to measure in terms of the behavior, the physiology, looking at the pathological indicators in the animals. They, they know all of these things. There are other people who know a bit less about it. They just know the basic thing that they did when they were students. So there, there is some variation in it, but it is covered by law in that everybody has to know something. I think most people who take on this job where they are a veterinarian checking on animals in a, in, in a place where they are kept, generally they try, and over a period of time they improve their knowledge, in identifying especially the behavioral signs that the animals have a problem. And so the indicators of poor welfare in the animals, they, they improve their ability in that everybody, when they are doing a job, will learn something about how to do it better. So I, I, I think it's not the case that everybody knows enough at the beginning, but responsible people do try to do that. And they also try to go on courses so that they can improve their abilities in, in, in this respect. So I, I think the majority of, of people who are inspecting, uh, they will be trying to do this. Uh, they may not be able to do everything at the beginning, but they are trying to do it. Uh, very clear, very clear. Uh, Professor Bloom, I, I was uh, personally fascinated by something I heard from you uh, and related um, not only to the fact that we must relate to all animals uh, following uh, morally acceptable uh, param parameters, uh, which obviously should be granted, uh, but that morality itself has a, a biological basis. Uh, this concept uh, was also expressed uh, by Darwin, uh, Darwin, according to whom, precisely for this reason, uh, even morality is uh, in some way subject to uh, evolutionary laws. What do you think about that? We humans are a species which lives in groups. We live in a group. It is not possible to live in a group unless you have a moral code. There are, there are some basic things which we all do. We learn about it from our early childhood. Don't carry out an action which is going to cause serious injury to somebody else. Uh, avoid. When you walk down the street, each of us, you walk down the street and you never push somebody into the road in front of a bus. We are very good at avoiding causing harm to others. Other social species do exactly the same thing. So if you are a cow, and you have big horns, how often do those animals harm another cow with their horns? 
they don't do it. Now and then there might be a fight, but normally they are very careful not to do it. A, a group of pigs, a group of dogs living together, they have serious weapons which they could easily use to harm other individuals. And most of the time, they really try hard not to harm other individuals. And if you look at the behavior of all of these socially living animals, they actually have a lot of cooperation. There are many times when they work together to get food or they work together to defend against danger or they uh, crowd together so they don't get cold. They are, they are collaborating in many areas. So all these social animals have a moral code. Morality is something with a biological foundation. And indeed, uh, religion is founded principally on morality. That's what is the central thing underlying each of the world's religions, a moral code. So it, it is the case that all of these animals, these socially living animals in particular, they try to live in a moral way most of the time. They don't succeed all the time, nor do, nor do humans. But so morality is not something which comes from the outside. It's something which you have to have if you're going to live in a stable social environment. So it's not just humans which have morality. Very, very interesting. Uh, in a previous uh, interview, uh, you stated that the uh, moral attitude towards animals is also necessary to ensure a sort of uh, social uh, stability. Yes. Do you think that the current problems arising from the spread of the coronavirus are connected with this concept? Well, the, 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 current, the current problems are partly because people have not been considering their interrelations with other species in an accurate way. And what we know about, what we know is that, uh, and I've sat for many years on the EU committees which are looking at new diseases which are emerging into human societies and emerging into the animals which we keep, the farm animals and the other animals which we keep. There are new diseases appearing. Some of those new diseases appear because there's already a virus which exists in some kind of animal and we expose ourselves to it or another animal which is coming in contact with humans uh, is exposed to it and then it gets transmitted to humans. Now we know that that happens but we are not careful enough in preventing it. So the COVID-19 uh, disease, we think that we know that the virus is almost certainly came originally from bats. Somebody caught some bats or contacted some bats and probably there was contact with another species. It was thought it might be pangolins Pangolins are, were being marketed as in, in China and for their scales because it was believed wrongly that they are useful in some way for a human medicine. So we, we know that this is how that has come about. If we understand our relationships with other species better, we are less likely to have these new diseases. And it, this is a really important thing which everybody has to try to do. And I think we have to change the way we are thinking about other species. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we are very, we humans are very focused on one species, our species. We are not thinking enough about other species. We are behaving in an immoral way, in the way we are going around the world. And I won't go into all the detail of it, but I, we, I think we need to change our attitude. And part of the change of attitude is to say, we are one of the species in the world. We have to work out all our interactions with the other species and we have to try to preserve the world as a whole, the world of living sentient beings, especially rather than just trying to preserve one species, because in the long run, we are damaging our own species if we are not thinking widely enough about our interaction with all the other species in the world. Thank you very much, Professor Bloom, for your answers. Pleasure for me too. Thank you.